four from the textbook. By the way, um, you guys all have the digital copy of the textbook, right? Yes, I sent you guys all. Okay, because I sent it when you, you started. You're my newest student. Okay, excellent. So everyone's got that. So you can use that any, anytime you need it. It should be able to be brought up on your phone. Um, use your textbook. Use the PowerPoint notes on phone or computer, whatever you want follow along with me, but you should have these. Um, all right, so this talk, again, is uh, secretly, not so secretly, about matter, okay? Um, so remember, we have kind of said there was roughly two things in the universe, right? There's matter and there's energy, and we even went so far as to say because of E equals MC squared, matter is just one form of energy, right? So it's really like one thing, it's energy, yeah? But uh, we can divide it up into two things, matter and energy. Um, so we defined energy last time, Let's define matter this time. Matter is anything with shape and form that occupies space. Things that are considered matter must have mass. So a photon of light, it's massless. So can it be considered matter? No, right? Photons are not matter. They're a form of energy. But an alpha particle made of protons and neutrons, that's a piece of something, right? That's matter, okay? Matter has mass, occupies space, and uh, under the influence of gravity, matter can be weighed. I can't weigh a bucket of light, right? I can weigh a bucket of protons, though. Energy cannot be weighed. Matter can be weighed. Okay, so some other terms that we'll associate with, um, with matter substances, with, with matter. Well, I even use the word substance here. Substance is just any material with definite and consistent composition. The simplest form of a substance is an element. So I take a chunk of um, iron, right? That's a substance, yeah? And that chunk of iron is made of atoms of iron, yeah? And so each little piece of that iron is an iron atom, and that's one element, okay? An element is the smallest chunk of a substance. So yeah, there's, there, there's your word element. Elements are substances that cannot be broken down into simpler substances by ordinary chemical or mechanical means. Atoms like to basically stay together. Now, big atoms are radioactive, not even big atoms, but some atoms are radioactive, okay? Um, so they spontaneously break apart. But under normal circumstances, elements, atoms, stay together, okay? If you want to break an atom apart, it takes energy to do that, okay? You know, like a nuclear power plant, no, that's a bad, bad example. You know the, um, the, the bombs we, we, we've dropped, the nuclear bombs we've dropped, right? The energy released from those nuclear bombs was because we broke atoms apart, right? They're fission bombs. They were fission bombs. They were bombs that released the energy locked up in atoms. Remember we said last time that if you took, you know, a single electron and converted it into, into pure energy, right? There's a lot of energy locked up in there, a single proton, right? It was hundreds of thousands of, of volts worth of energy, yeah? Um, that's the idea, okay? A a elements like to stay together. And if you can break them apart, you can release energy that's, that's bound up in their, in their mass, okay? <clears throat> Elements are substances that cannot be broken down into simpler forms, and atoms are just one piece of an element. The smallest single unit of an element retaining all of those chemical behaviors. So an atom of hydrogen always acts like hydrogen. An atom of helium always acts like helium, okay? That's the idea. What we call chemical behavior is just the making or breaking of physical connections between atoms in which they share components. The components that atoms share are electrons. That shouldn't be a surprise to you by now. You learned that atoms are, uh, consist of a dense nucleus with orbiting electrons. The electrons are the thing on the outside of the atom, right? That's what bumps up against and interacts with other atoms, okay? So all of chemistry and chemical behavior has to do with atoms bumping together and either making, breaking, or, or not interacting at all, 
right? Making bonds, breaking bonds are not interacting at all, okay? That's all of chemistry. And it has to do with the interactions of the electrons with nearby electrons, okay? This is why, um, you know, when we use x-rays and they, we can take, you know, chuck atoms out of, chuck electrons out of an atom, right? It's going to change the way the chemistry behaves because chemistry is all about electrons interacting with other electrons. And if you remove some, then the atom's going to act differently, okay? Um, so, atom, smallest single unit of an element. A couple more terms that are useful. Compound, mixture, and molecule. Compounds are substances in which atoms of different elements are bound together chemically. You know, an easy example is just water, right? Water is hydrogen and oxygen. So it's two different um, elements bound together chemically, yeah? Whereas a mixture is two or more substances that are not chemically bound together. So you take like water and something else and you mix them together. They don't bond, but they're mixed. Okay. They can in principle separate. Okay. Like, like, like cream into coffee could in principle separate oil, oil into water can separate. You can mix them, but then they'll separate, right? Mixture. These substances will separate over time. Like oil into water does it quick, right? But other things may take longer, like cream into coffee, it'll, it'll eventually separate, right? Um, but that's the idea, right? You, you mix two compounds together and you've got a mixture. A molecule is the word we use when there are two or more atoms that are chemically bound together. So, you know you breathe air, right? What's the like useful part of the air that we breathe? What do we call it? Oxygen. And uh, we could, what's the shortened up way to, to talk about oxygen? What do we call it? O2, right? O2 is saying oxygen two times, right? Two oxygen atoms com combined, right? Chemically bound together. Turns out there's a good reason why oxygen atoms want to link up with each other, but we don't need to talk about that at this very moment. They do though, they, they link up, okay? And so, uh, yeah, that's actually the example used here. The smallest unit of a compound is a molecule. And so anytime you have more than one atom bonded, you've got a molecule. It doesn't have to be two of the same atom, okay? Like water is a molecule, right? Hydrogen and oxygen, okay? So let me give you an example, one we use and actually use in radiography. Uh, barium sulfate. It, this is a mixture. Let me explain why. Um, barium sulfate is uh, barium, B-A, sulfur, S, and oxygen, which is the eight part of A-T-E part of sulfate. Um, and there's, there's four oxygen. If was, you, we zoom in on this little barium sulfate model, there's going to be four oxygen atoms on there because it's little, in the subscript you see a four to the right of the O. Okay. So it's barium, sulfur, oxygen, and that's a uh, molecule. Okay. Called barium sulfate. And you take barium sulfate and you, it's a powder, and you mix it into a cup of water. Okay. Um, so you see the little H2O molecules floating around there too. So you have H2O molecules, you have barium sulfate molecules, and you mix them all together, and you make this like milkshake drink. Um, and your patients, um, not yours, but when you do, if you go up to the next level of radiography and you do fluoroscopy, um, you may have patients ingest by mouth a barium sulfate suspension, and they drink it. It lines their in, um, their intestinal tract, and we can X-ray it now and see like the outline and uh, see if there's any you know, abnormalities, let's say. Uh, so barium sulfate suspension is a mixture of two different molecules which will never chemically combine. Water's happy on its own, barium sulfate's happy on its own, and so you pour them together and mix them up, they're gonna be mixed, but they'll never bond up, okay? Good. It's like taking, it's honestly, uh, Doing it is the same as taking like Nesquik and putting it into a, you know a, a glass of milk, right? It's the same exact idea. Um, when you do that, you know the milk molecules and the Nesquik molecules are not bonded <coughs> chemically; they're just mixed up together. Okay, uh, it's the same thing we're doing here with barium sulfate suspension. 
Suspension means to it su means the molecules are suspended in in some medium. The medium in this case is just water. Okay, so let me show you what barium sulfate is. So I, again, I, I kind of said it, but here you have a, an atom of barium. That's one single element of barium, one single atom of one element of barium. You have the sulfur atom, and then linked up to sulfur is four oxygen atoms. Okay, And because of the um, composition of the orbiting electrons around all of these atoms, they want to bind up. They want to link up together. Okay, if we used other atoms, they might not want to form this same kind of bond. Okay, it has to do with how many electrons are in the outermost orbit of an atom. Because if you think about like the atoms bumping up next to each other, it's really only the outermost orbits that are going to be able to interact, right? Um, so it depends on the number of electrons in the outermost orbits. We call the outermost orbit, by the way, the valence shell. Okay which might spark a little bit of memory from you in high school, talking about covalent bonds. Yeah, we're going to talk about covalent bonds today. But, uh, but, but the valence shell is the outermost shell of an atom. Okay. Um, so good. We're going to do that. We're going to talk more about that. But that's the idea. Okay. So now let's, um, let's maybe backtrack a little. We talked about you know, some definitions, showed you an example in radiography, how we can you know, discuss these atoms. So let's, let's backtrack and talk about atoms. Um, so this atom happens to be an atom of barium. They're not showing you the Rutherford model. They're not showing you Schrodinger's model. What model of an atom are they showing you? Bohr's model of an atom, which shows a dense nucleus with orbiting electrons, but that have to sit in specific shell levels, specific energy levels, right? That solves the problem that Schroeder, sorry, that um, Rutherford had where his electrons would have just spiraled into the nucleus and, and the atom would disappear, okay? So Bohr's model works for radiography. You see each electron orbit, um, each electron energy level represented as an orbit, okay? The lowest energy position for an electron is closest to the nucleus. Okay, kind of like us here, right? Our lowest energy position in the room is when we're seated in it uh, on, on the floor, right? Because you could fall out of your chair, right? But you can't fall out of the floor, right? You're already on the floor, okay? Um, so the closer you are to Earth's center, the less energy, less potential energy you have, right? That's the whole reason why I did the potential energy talk last time, so we can get used to talking about... Um, uh, electrons and their energy levels. Okay, so when I stood up on the chair, I gained energy, right? And what kind of energy did I gain? Potential energy. Okay, so and when I went back to the floor, I lost potential energy, right? But then I made some noise when I hit the floor and stuff like that, right? I, I released that energy. I converted that energy. Well, the lowest energy position for an electron is the closest shell to the nucleus. Okay. So these innermost electrons are the lowest energy electrons, okay? Turns out they're also bound the most tightly. That also makes sense if you convert this over to like talking about us, okay? Sitting here on the ground on Earth's, you know, crust, I'm pretty glued down to Earth, right? Like I can jump and I can maybe get a foot or two off the ground, right? Um, but I can't get myself into orbit, right? But if I'm on the space station orbiting Earth, right? I can hop off the space station and get it, get myself into orbit pretty easily, right? Because I'm in a higher potential energy position, okay? Similarly, with atoms, the innermost shells are bound the tightest, but they're the lowest energy shells. I'm in my lowest energy position sitting on Earth. I'm also bound the most tightly to Earth right now, okay? So there's a relationship between the energy that an electron has, the potential energy it has, and how tightly bound it is, okay? When electrons are in their lowest energy positions, they're more tightly bound to the atom, okay? So using that, the outermost electron shell, should that be a high energy position or a low energy position? The outermost shell is high energy, right? 
Is the outermost shell bound tightly to the atom or not so tightly? Not so tightly, okay? So the further away you are from the nucleus of an atom, and you're an electron, the more energy you have and the less tightly the atom's holding on to you, okay? So it takes little energy to remove an outer shell electron, but a lot of energy to remove an inner shell electron. Make sense? Okay. So this atom of barium has a number of electrons and a nucleus. Single atom of barium has an atomic number. The atomic number of atoms is given as a capital Z. In this case, barium's Z number or atomic number is 56. Okay. Now, that number given as a capital Z, you'll see on the periodic table as well. When we, we'll, I'll put a periodic table up on the screen in a while so we don't have to keep looking at that one. But um, that Z number, this is, this is important, tells you the number of positive charges in the nucleus. Positive charges are protons, right? So it tells you the number of protons in the nucleus. We call it atomic number. You need to remember that because there's another unit we have called atomic mass. This is not that, okay? The atomic number, given as a capital Z, tells you how many protons in the nucleus of an atom. How does that relate to the number of electrons orbiting the atom? It should be the same, right? In a happy, at, so a happy atom, when I say happy atom, you know atoms can't be happy or sad, right? But when I say a happy atom, I mean an electrically neutral atom, okay? So atoms are happiest when they're electrically neutral, okay? They're, um, they have less overall energy if they're electrically neutral. So if there's 56 positive charges in the nucleus of an atom, the only way it can be electrically neutral is if there's also 56 negative charges orbiting. The negative charges are electrons, and of course they orbit, okay? Now, what, now if you look at the shell levels, okay? The innermost shell that's close to the nucleus, we call that the K shell. And remember we said it's for no good reason, right? It doesn't mean anything. The L shell is the next one out, and then M and N and O and P. You don't have to count the number of electrons, just look over here. Notice how the K shell holds two, right? The L shell holds eight. The M shell holds 18. The N shell holds 18. But then the O shell is back to eight. And the P shell only holds two. This actually is not nice and kind of symmetrical. It's not always going to be symmetrical in all atoms, but so that what my point is that there's no like looking at it right now, there's no good like algorithmic way to figure out why are there this number of electrons in each shell level? Why can't we just pack all the electrons into the first shell and have 56 electrons in one shell, right? So we're going to need to learn rules, rules about how atoms arrange their electrons, okay? Because you see the electrons are arranged. There's two in the first shell, eight in the next shell, and so on, right? And we need to account for 56 electrons orbiting. And so we're going to need to talk about how atoms arrange themselves into shells, how the electrons in atoms arrange themselves into shells, okay? And so I'm going to teach you about that in, in a minute here, but let's just keep that in the back of our mind for a minute. If an atomic number is 56, that means there's 56 electrons. What's going to ultimately matter is how many electrons end up in the outermost shell of the atom. And in this case, how many electrons are in the outermost shell? Two. Two. Okay, keep that in mind. We'll move on. Um, so here's some radiographically significant elements, the ones that you've got to just commit to memory. Okay, um, do your best. Try to, try to work on memorizing these flashcards, just brute memorization, whatever works for you, but you've got to work on memorizing these. So oh, these are elements every radiographer should know. Um, let's look at some of the basic ones first. So the most basic ones are the smallest, okay? Uh, hydrogen and helium. Just, just to uh, give you a quick feel for this, hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. There is more hydrogen than there is any other element, okay? Hydrogen was the first element. 
It's also the simplest element, okay? So you guys probably know that we have a theory of how the universe came into existence. We call it the Big Bang Theory, right? And uh, when the universe went bang, hydrogen was the first element, okay? Turns out it actually didn't happen for several hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. But anyways, hydrogen is the first element. And hydrogen's atomic number is one. So now what do you know about hydrogen? One proton. One proton. And now you know that. So what else do you know about hydrogen? One electron, one electron right? Can you have less than one of something? If you have less than that, you have zero, right? We only, only whole units, right? We can't have half an electron, right? So we can only have one electron or no electrons, one proton or no protons, right? So you can't have anything smaller than hydrogen. It's one piece, okay? It's the smallest possible element, hydrogen. Helium, helium came from the first, um, first generation of stars, okay? What happens in the universe is you, you make all this hydrogen gas, gravity likes to pull things together, right? Remember we said gravity is always attractive, right? So gravity pulls all these gas, big clouds of gas together in the, in, in the early universe and um, they form stars, okay? Stars form, sorry, stars fuse hydrogen into helium. You take two hydrogen atoms and you smash them together hard enough and you've made helium. Okay, this is how we make elements. They get made in stars. Okay, it takes a lot of energy to smash atoms together and have them fuse together. Okay, but if you do it, you can make a new element. Okay, hydrogen fuses together to make helium in the earliest stars. In fact, that's what stars run on nowadays too. Is is hydrogen uh, fusion, hydrogen to helium fusion. So our sun's producing a bunch of helium right now, and it will do so for you know, billions of years. Those are the most basic elements, the two most abundant. In our body, carbon and oxygen. You've got more oxygen than any other element in your body, okay? And it's not in the form of O2, it's in the form of H2O, okay? You know you're about three quarters water, right? So 75% of you is water. The biggest piece of water, water is hydrogen and oxygen. Oxygen has an atomic number of eight. So it's eight times heavier than hydrogen, okay? And your body is made of hydrogen and, and, and oxygen, mostly. Oxygen is the heaviest thing, you're mostly oxygen, okay? You're more oxygen than anything else. Oxygen's atomic number is eight. So now what do you know about oxygen? It's uh, heavier than helium. It's heavier than hydrogen, heavier than helium. It's got eight protons in its nucleus and eight electrons orbiting. Right? Okay. I, I skipped carbon, but carbon has six. If you're into science fiction at all, you probably heard that we're carbon-based life forms, right? That means that our molecules are built on carbon skeletons, okay? Uh, our not, skeleton is not built on carbon, but you get the idea. The molecules that we're made of are built on carbon, right? Sugar, for example, glucose, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. That's why we call them carbohydrates, okay? Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. In the x-ray machine, Aluminum. Aluminum's atomic number, 13. So aluminum, heavier than carbon and oxygen, but lighter than other elements. Calcium in our body, calcium's atomic number is 20, 20 times heavier than hydrogen. Iodine and barium, respectively 53 and 56 for their atomic numbers. In the x-ray machine, Tungsten and rhenium are used in the x-ray machine as a, as a target. Now, if that doesn't mean anything to you right now, that's fine. But if it does, you know what the x-ray target is. It's made of tungsten and, and sometimes rhenium. As well as another uh, element called molybdenum, but we're not going to worry about that one right now. It's not on here. Uh, x-ray shielding is usually done with lead. Lead's atomic number is 82. So how many electrons are orbiting lead? 82 electrons, right? Uranium... 92, and so on. So, and that's a radioactive element, an example of a radioactive element. Okay, interesting. So we've got our common elements that we'll have, uh, you know, in and around the universe, in our body, in the x-ray machine. All right, is so everyone feeling okay with that so far? All right. Stop me, right? Stop me if you have questions. It's a great day to slow me down. Okay. 
So I want to circle back to, I did, I, did, I think I've done a pretty good job about physical structure of atoms, but the, it's, I'm going to go in order of notes here. So I want to circle back to physical structure of atoms now and remind you of a couple of, of things, okay? Um, so, and we've said some of this already, but, okay, so we, we, I gave you dates for these things. So when and where and how do we figure out what we know now, right? So reminder, Ernest Rutherford, 1911, says atoms consist of a dense, positively charged nucleus. We knew that before, right? We knew we knew that from earlier. Okay, um, so we, this is that was a, that was known, but his um, main discovery was is that they were surrounded. The nucleus is surrounded by a cloud of negatively charged electrons. Niels Bohr shows us that electrons could only exist at certain energy levels in prescribed orbits. And if, a, if an electron wanted to go from one energy level to the next, what does it have to do? What does an electron have to do to go up a shell level or down a shell level? What'd you say? <clears throat> by, by, um, by anchoring the photon. And so if an electron absorbs a photon, is it gonna go up a shell level or down? up right um it's putting energy into it right photons of light are energy and if you put energy into something you give it more potential you, you can't give it more potential right so okay so if an electron's going to go up a shell level according to bohr's model it has to absorb a photon of light but it can't absorb just any photon of light it has to absorb a photon of light with enough energy to push it up to the next shell level right if you don't absorb enough energy, you can't get to the next shell level. If I'm standing on a ladder and I don't have enough energy to pick my foot up and get to the next rung of the ladder, if I can only pick my foot up half of the way to the next rung, then am I going to get up on the next rung of the ladder? No, right? If I want to get up on the next rung of a ladder, I got to pick my foot up all the way up to the next rung. Yeah? That means I got to use a specific amount of energy. I, um, it, to use the right terms, a discrete amount of energy, which means a, a, a specific amount of energy. So Bohr's, Bohr's ideas were huge. Uh, electrons existed in orbits that were discrete. You had to either absorb a specific amount of energy to jump up an orbit or lose a specific amount of energy to jump down an orbit. Okay. This is a big thing. Bohr's, uh, this is why Bohr gets credited as being like the grandfather of quantum physics because he's the first one to figure out that atoms do anything like discreetly in, 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 in specific energies. Yeah. Um, so more accurately though, because we said Bohr's model's great, but then along came Schrodinger in 1926, right? And Schrodinger turns it all on its head. So more accurately, these orbits or shells are actually made up of something, things called suborbitals or orbitals in which each orbital accommodates two and only two electrons with opposite spins and so on. So let me show you what atoms actually look like and then we'll just go back to using Bohr's model for the rest of all of this, okay? So I showed you a picture of, of the, remember that colored picture with the blobs? I showed you that those were the wave functions, right? The orbitals. This is uh, another example of these orbitals. Orbitals can look different. There's circular orbitals. There's dumbbell shaped orbitals that look like, a, you know, blob on one end and a blob on the other end. Um, there's these other orbitals that kind of look like a double pacifier, okay? Um, the point is, is that an orbital does not look like that. Does not look like an individual shell level. Okay, so the actual energy levels, orbits that the electrons sit in don't look like individual shells, even though we talk about them like that. Okay, what they actually look like are, are this. Okay, so what you have here is you have a n orbital. Let's look at the s orbital, for example, n s orbital. So if an atom, if an atom is arranged with its electrons in an s orbital, the electrons which there will only be two in this orbital, can be anywhere within the orbital, but are not located until we measure it, until we do an experiment to measure the location. It can be anywhere within that, within that orbital, okay? Um, 
In fact, it's, it's, it's in all of the places within that orbital. We say the electron is in a superposition of states. It's in all of those positions until it's measured to be in one of them. That's orbitals. So again, for our purposes, we like this Bohr's model because it gets kind of confusing to talk about orbitals. If you take a chemistry class, you're going to be stuck with learning about orbitals and you're going to have to use them because that's what we actually know is right. Okay, But for radiography, the Bohr's model of the atom showing only the shells or general orbits of the electrons is sufficient to illustrate most of the concepts that we need to learn about. Okay, So we don't need to learn about quantum physics. We don't need to learn about deep, deep chemistry ideas. We just need to learn that electrons are arranged in energy levels, shells. Okay, And those shells have discrete energies, have specific energies. Okay, That's all we need to do the, everything we want to do. So um, some things we should get used to understanding. Atoms are mostly empty space. So what we show you, you know like when you look at the model, like, like if you look at the a picture of the solar system like in a book, right? It usually puts the sun, then Mercury, then Venus, then Earth, then Mars, all right next to each other, right? Um, but you know that's not true. You know there's huge astrophysical distances, 98 million miles between the Earth and the sun, right? So you know that's not right, okay? When you look at a picture of an atom, you have to know the same thing, okay? The scale we're using is not right, okay? There is big distances between the dense nucleus and the orbiting electrons, okay? So to give you a feel for this, they say if the nucleus were the size of a marble, that's the nucleus, size of a marble, and it was placed at the goal line of, of a football field, the nearest electron shell is at the other goal line, okay? The nearest one. And that's if it were the size of a marble, okay? Which is huge compared to the size of an atom. And that electron at the other end of the football field would be the size of a grain of sand. So hugely, huge spaces, huge differences in space, and huge differences in size, right? When, I when we show you, you know, this picture, and you zoom in, you know, in this picture, the atom, the electrons and the, the nuclear particles look like they're the same size, right? The green electrons and the gray nuclear particles look the same size. In all reality, the electrons are about 2,000 times smaller than the nuclear particles. So they're teeny compared to the nuclear particles. So we have to lie a little bit, right? We have to fudge a little bit when we're telling you this stuff because um, you couldn't visualize it otherwise, okay? So yeah, uh, the electrons are far away from the nucleus, so the atom's filled by mostly empty space, okay? And you learn that's even not really true because I showed you that the electrons are actually in orbitals, right? Orbitals take up big amounts of space, okay? But when you picture it as Bohr's model of the atom, there's lots of space between electrons and nuclei. So why do we... So, okay, it was rumored that uh, Rutherford, after he does his discovery, figures out that atoms have... Remember, before Rutherford, we thought that atoms were like a, the plum pudding model, right? A big bag of particles, right? But then Rutherford does his experiment and goes, well, dang, atoms have the dense, tiny nucleus and orbiting electrons. They're mostly empty space, right? He knew that. And so he was rumored the next morning to be afraid as he walked down the stairs to be worried. He was worried that he might fall through the stairs after learning that atoms are mostly empty space. Just a rumor, kind of a joke. But the idea is like, we're mostly empty space. If atoms are mostly empty space and we're made of atoms, that means we're mostly empty space, right? I don't feel like empty space. I know you don't, right? This table feels pretty solid. Yeah. So this feeling of solidity is just that, a feeling, okay? It's not true, okay? Objects seem solid because of the collective negative electrical repulsion between the outermost shells of atoms. Remember, opposite charges repel, sorry, opposite charges attract, like charges repel, right? So you've got all of these atoms with um, like charges in, the or in, the, in their orbiting electrons, pushing against each other, right? I don't go through this table because my atoms are pushing against the table's atoms, not with like solidity, but with electromagnetic repulsion, right? Repulsive forces. 
When two atoms approach each other, their outer skin consists of a negative screen, a, sorry, a screen of negative charged electrons moving about. So you don't actually touch anything ever, right? Your atoms get near other atoms and they repel each other, okay? That's what we feel as solidity or touch or that. Okay, um, so yeah, we're mostly empty space. We've never touched anything, <laughs> and that's a big, big discovery, right? And so you think, think back to Rutherford in 1911 discovering this, and and how he must have thought, right? Being the first person to learn this, and then having to like walk down your stairs the next morning, right? You just figured out something that no one else knows. Okay, so that's a big deal. Within the nucleus, the protons have an electrical charge. And that charge is plus one. So every proton has a charge of plus one. All protons are the same. They all have a charge of plus one. And they're balanced out by the orbiting electrons, which all have an electric charge of minus one. So even though an electron is 2,000 times smaller than a proton, it has the exact same electric charge. Well, exact, equal, and opposite, right? So they balance out each other electrically, but not by mass, okay? So their masses are very, very different, but their electric repulsion or electric properties are the same, but opposite. Same magnitude, let's say. So good. Now let's look, get some definitions, some units, some numbers to get familiar with. First is atomic mass unit. Uh, the AMU is a way of um, talking about the mass, one way of talking about the mass of uh, particles that atoms are made of. We know that atoms are made of protons, neutrons, electrons, okay? We say that the proton has an atomic mass of one. So we're comparing everything to protons, right? Atomic mass of one for a proton. In that case, if an electron's 2,000 times smaller, then an electron has an atomic mass of one two thousandth, an atomic mass unit. And it's just by convention. We just decided that we're gonna call the protons one and everything else is compared to protons. Atomic number you guys should already have. That's the big Z, capital Z. This is the number of protons in a nucleus, determining the chemical identity of the element. Because the number of protons in the nucleus tells you how many electrons you'll hang on to. The number of electrons you'll hang on to determines how many electrons are going to be in the outermost shell. The outermost shell interacts with all the other atoms, that's chemical interactions, and so the number of protons ultimately determines the chemical behavior of the atom. So if your atom changes its number of protons, called transmutation, if that number changes, then the atom behaves chemically different. Dmitry Mendeleev's law of periodicity tells us that the properties of elements are periodic functions of their atomic weight. We'll spend more time on that in a minute. They repeat themselves at specific periods as the atomic number increases. And he constructs the first periodic table based on this. So, um, let's, what time is it? 10, 15? Let's take a couple minutes. I'm gonna, I want you guys to be a little bit rested while, while I go into this next section.